Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A very warm welcome on behalf of the Site Savers events team. We are very much looking forward to supporting you with today's webinar, Bridging COVID-19 Response and Recovery, Learning from the Inclusive Futures Programme. I am now delighted to hand over to Johannes to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Inclusive Futures side event. Um, my name is Johannes Trimmel, and I'm the Director for Disability Inclusive Development at Sightsavers. And together with um, colleagues in Sightsavers and in 15 other partner organizations, we are running the Inclusive Futures program, which, uh, which has the purpose of supporting disability inclusive development, um, enhancing quality of life of persons with disabilities, but also generating evidence on what works and what doesn't work in disability inclusive development. Now, as you can imagine, the last year was a very unusual year with the COVID-19 pandemic hitting us and it had a severe impact on the way we were doing our programs and initiatives um, we are undertaking. So quite soon um, in the last year, we pivoted towards COVID-19 and started a number of um, direct COVID-19 response task projects to really help um, to reach um, disabled people, which in many cases were completely forgotten by COVID-19 response um, initiatives by governments and humanitarian organizations. Now, but more than just um, reaching persons with disabilities with direct support, we were also keen to show and to demonstrate that a COVID-19 or any crisis response is possible to be undertaken in a way that persons with disabilities are not left behind. Um, we are convinced that the inclusion of persons with disabilities is necessary, possible, and the right thing to do. During this webinar, we want to share some of our learnings that we have made in the programs um, in the COVID-19 response. We also want to talk about how this links to the COVID-19 recovery that's starting in many countries now, especially on economic recovery, and want to share some of the um, findings from a study that was undertaken by our help desk on the impact of COVID-19 on organizations of persons with disabilities and women with disabilities in particular. And with that introduction, I want to hand over to Lorraine Weplink, um, who is a disability researcher, advisor, and an inspiration for many of us working in the field of disability inclusion to summarize some of the learnings we have identified. The floor is yours, Lorraine. Thanks very much, Johannes. And um, welcome to everyone. The unprecedented scale of the health and the subsequent socioeconomic crisis created by COVID-19 forced all of us to change. It had an impact on our health, um, on our social and economic behaviours, and it forced the development sector to rethink its way of working and its general priorities. Early in the pandemic, I began to notice that the shift from development to relief work wasn't sitting very easily with sector providers. We weren't prepared for this. Most importantly, I saw how many of the gains in terms of human rights and inclusive programming were suffering. Once again, I started to come across familiar language oh, it's too difficult, we don't have time, there's not enough resources to work inclusively. All of those um, phrases started to um, just resurface. So therefore, it is extremely important that research happens to find out what the true impact of the pandemic has been on inclusive programming. How have people with disabilities and organizations of persons with disabilities OPDs, how have they been impacted by what happened during the first few phases and how can we ensure that as the de development sector we learn lessons and build on what worked. So our panel is going to bring together a lot of early learning from some really key pieces of research. 
Um, what I'd like to just start by sharing is um, some key learning points from the Inclusive Futures Programme research, um, Disability Inclusive Response to COVID-19. So this draws together information from uh, many projects that pivoted to COVID-19, but in particular we'll be uh, you know, summarising Bangladesh, Nepal, Nigeria, Kenya and Tanzania. And we're going to be hearing in much more detail from a lot of these um, programs today, which is really exciting. I guess in summary, I, I have to summarize um, lots and lots of very, very rich information. Mary also will have um, the same challenge, but basically um, in four short bullet points, we definitely learned that you have to ensure local needs are included in response planning by partnering with a diverse range of OPDs so that the gaps in responses can be highlighted and mitigated. So we look in particular at Kenya um, for an example, which we will hear more about directly. Um, but the national OPD there worked with 28 community level OPD partners. And so this diversity and this partnering is what helped to enrich and ensure that as many people with disabilities were included in government responses um, as possible. It's really important that that diverse range um, of needs is highlighted. Definitely collect and use data meaningfully. Don't delay responses to wait for data, but use it to make sure that no one is being left out. In Nepal, for example, the local government um, was using community level data. It was um, in order to, to, to help target its response, but none of that information contained anything about persons with disabilities. So OPDs were able to step in um, and work locally to create a, a system of collecting data and information which helps to fill that information gap. Really, really important. Thirdly, we need to ensure that uh, health and economic information, social behaviour information is produced in accessible and relevant ways. There were lots and numerous examples of where OPDs were taking government information which wasn't accessible and putting it into accessible and meaningful forms for their constituents. And at the same time, putting pressure onto service providers to be inclusive from the start. And then finally, that we all have to plan and act inclusively across the board. So within health, within work, within education, we need to be working with OPDs to ensure that all responses are inclusive, not just a small range. So that's um, all I wanted to say uh, on the Inclusive Futures research. We also have uh, research which um, the help desk carried out specifically on the impact on OPDs um, the organizations of persons with dis disabilities themselves. We're gonna go into a lot more detail um, in a seminar on that tomorrow. And we also have um, um, uh, some people who are gonna talk a little bit more about that um, during our panel today. Now I'd like to hand back to Johannes um, to uh, carry on, um, but I, I, I do hope that everyone enjoys the rich information that is gonna come out of this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine, for this um, very good and concise summary. And just to say, we are currently finalizing a learning paper that will highlight the learning that Lorraine shared and go in, we'll also go in some, some details. So you can expect that to be announced shortly. I'm now handing over to Mary Wickenden from the Institute of Development Studies. And disability researcher with a particular interest in inclusive and participatory research. And she has led together with her team and with many people, disabled people in Bangladesh and, and Nepal, a qualitative research, um, especially reaching out also to people who normally are more left behind, or as we call them, underrepresented groups. And I hand the challenge to you, Mary, um, to share some of the findings and what, what you have learned and what the researchers in countries have learned during that research piece. Great, thanks. Thanks, Johannes. Um, so yes, I'm from IDS, Institute for Development Studies, and we worked in collaboration with local 
uh, INGO consortium partners in uh, several countries, but today we're just focusing on Nepal and Bangladesh, and also with the OPDs in the countries. We had two local researchers in each country, and in, each, in both cases, one was a researcher with disabilities in each country. So the aims of the study to were to explore qualitatively the experiences and the perceptions of the COVID pandemic um, with people with disabilities to better understand how it had affected them, and particularly focusing on the most marginalized groups, as Johanna said. So we used in-depth qualitative research um, using a narrative approach, which basically asks people for their stories, to and focusing on people with intellectual, psychosocial, and uh, multiple impairments such as deaf blindness. So we weren't trying to get a, um, to cover absolutely all the different impairment groups. So small numbers of people in each country, so 20 in Bangladesh and 15 in Nepal, and each of them were interviewed twice at, at, at separate intervals. Um, and we were really looking for their perspectives. So these were done online in a COVID safe way, and we used participatory analysis with the team online. And we at the end, we had a validation meeting with all the interviewees of both countries so that they could hear about the findings and make comments. So the findings were that um, people felt that there had been a lot of subjective emotional feelings, strong feelings, um, before we talk about any concrete things. So the strong feelings were that this was a shocking and uncertain and destabilizing time with lots of uncertainty and disorientation. So a, a Bangladeshi man with deaf blindness said, everyone has spent their days in misery. And a Nepali woman with psychosocial impairment said, everyone is sad and worried because of the pandemic. So the kind of um, emotions that people felt were shock and confusion, hopelessness and helplessness, fear, like fear of the virus, fear of being hungry, fear of other people sometimes and their responses, uh, feelings of loss, like loss of work, loss of school, loss of dreams for the future, loss of opportunities, loss of freedom, um, and also feelings of boredom and frustration at not being able to go out and being stuck at home. So particularly some girls with intellectual impairments said that they were really fed up with being at home and not allowed to go out. Also, there was anger from many people, the frustration and the worry, and sometimes that led to family conflict um, or conflict outside the home as well, um, you know, because of the worry about um, fulfilling basic family needs and causing a lot of stress. So overall, we got the really strong impression from what people said in their stories that the impact on people's mental health had been very, very negative. Then there were lots of concrete impacts both related to gender and impairment, so people's individual identities, but also to do with the structures. So the difference, there was a difference between what men and women experienced. Um, so women feeling they had extra responsibilities at home, men worrying about not being able to provide for their families, a strain on gender relations. People with different impairments had different experiences. So for instance, people with uh, visual impairment um, had a lot of worries about touching others or others were worried about touching them. And of course, that's how they, they get support and understand the world through touch. People with intellectual impairments felt that they had lack of information that they could understand. So they were puzzled and scared about what was going on. Um, there were increased communication barriers, for instance, for people with deaf blindness um, and people with high support needs also couldn't always get the care they normally had. We had a couple of parents and they also reported increased stress at having their child at home all day, every day. Um, from the structural point of view, lots of financial and economic difficulties around loss of income, fear of starvation or having to reduce consumption of food, increased costs of food, increased costs of transport and medical costs. There, people talked about help from the government and help from INGOs, but felt that this hadn't been enough and sometimes it was difficult to access. Also, help from OPDs was very much appreciated. So with finances, with hygiene kits, food packages and emotional assistance support. Um, some people said they wouldn't be able to cope without the OPD support. But generally, they said that um, many services and information was inaccessible or inaccurate information sometimes and difficult to get relief in the way that other people perhaps were. So overall, an exacerbation of the pre-existing pre 
disadvantage that people with disabilities often had, making things worse in this situation. So um, their recommendations were a bit similar to the ones that Lorraine has already told us, a need for accessible information in multiple formats, more consultation with OPDs in, in planning for disasters and pandemics and such events, um, more disability awareness in the provision of services, and more awareness raising about how disadvantage can be exacerbated. So I hope I've stayed in my time and that's it from me. Thanks, Mary. Perfectly in your time and you packed a lot of um, really interesting information. It was really good to hear that the impact of COVID-19 on people with disabilities is a very kind of um, diverse field and one cannot just say this is how it is for persons with disabilities. There's many, many realities and many factors. Um, and I think that's important to recognize. Also good to hear that the, that the recommendations are aligning with Lorraine's and the program recommendations. So it, it's another kind of, I would say, um, valid point of validation of, of what, what we found out. Um, so you gave a great introduction into our next speaker or speakers. Um, so that will be Anika Raman Lippi from the Center for Disability and Development in Bangladesh. And she's accompanied by a woman with deaf blindness who was a participant in the program. So Annika, over to you, to you to hear about the Bangladesh experience and especially CDD's experience in reaching out to persons with deaf blindness in our COVID-19 response. You have to unmute you, Annika. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, the organizers, for uh, giving us this opportunity. Uh, as you know, we are from three organizations actually representing this whole uh, thing. Um, uh, uh, the, the work we are doing in Bangladesh, it's uh, the Sense International and the Sense International India, and uh, we are all working together in Bangladesh. And uh, we are doing many things, but uh, I would like to just start with the COVID um, pandemic, what happened right after the onset of the uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. So, you know, uh, from actually from uh, uh, February, all the education and institution, uh, education institute was shut down. So education is still, uh, uh, still there, uh, not uh, open, they are still closed. And uh, most, uh, uh, especially the longer uh, period and everyday medical interventions, they are also put on hold. Uh, family income got reduced because many people uh, lost their job uh, or a source of income. And uh, through our uh, work, as you know, we uh, provide home-based rehabilitation services to persons with deaf blindness. So that got disrupted in a, a huge way and also uh, the communication at various levels got dis disrupted also. And then uh, because of you know, the way it gets uh, uh, spread out or people contract it, so there was lots of uh, stigma uh, faced by many people, uh, especially the people who are front level, uh, front workers like health workers and also persons with disabilities, which Mary already uh, highlighted a little bit. Next slide, please. So the overall effect, if we say, if we say what happened is that uh, we, you know, we, uh, with some of the persons with deaf blindness, we have been working for many years and we achieved a lot and they learned a lot and there were so many developments. But we, uh, because of this disruption, we lost uh, this uh, achievement. Many went back to square one, many. Uh, and uh, so the, Deterioration of their health condition was one thing because many couldn't take their medicines uh, uh, continuously. There was a disruption in it. So it's that they, they also started to have their uh, old problems or recurrence. Uh, you have to excuse me, the prayer call is happening. So it's going to make a little bit noise now. Uh, so, and uh, the other two uh, impact uh, or effect we have, uh, we have seen, which Mary already has highlighted, is the increase of poverty level and reduce the purchase capacity of the families of uh, persons uh, 
of, of families who have a, a family member uh, with their blindness. And then there is also this isolation and invisibility and disempowerment. And I especially like to highlight about the uh, invisibility one. You know, many people with their blindness don't have any obvious uh, uh, features uh, by which you can say that that person cannot see and hear altogether. Uh, so they were left out from any kind of uh, listing for relief program or any kind of government services. It, it happened in many ways, if, uh, in many areas uh, where we work. Next slide, please. And uh, what we did is that uh, with the uh, UK, UK, uh, UK aid and also with the uh, uh, inclusive future and uh, all other support, we reached out uh, families with uh, cash support so that they can uh, uh, purchase what uh, they need actually. Uh, we could prepare a package, uh, but uh, that might not have been very really appropriate uh, as per their need. And uh, we provided this money in three installment uh, within the month, uh, within four months of period. And then we also provided seed money to the families who lost their idea so that they can start a new, another idea. I mean, idea means income generating activities. And then we also provided support to uh, many families uh, so that they can access the government and other private organizations COVID relief programs. And uh, two months later, we also started our home-based rehabilitation program. First, we started through phones and then we started to do the physical visits and uh, that's how we could resume our um, services again with all those families. And definitely we maintained all the health protocols. Next slide, please. Uh, now I'm going to uh, share the story of Maliha, who, who is going to also share her personal feelings. Uh, she's a girl, she's 23 years old, and she uh, is having a partial deaf blindness since the age of seven. And she is now a student of grade 12. Her mother is a health worker and she's the only caregiver for her also. Uh, and at present, she uh, is uh, not able to maintain her uh, health hygiene practices and also she depends uh, fully on her mother. What happened during the, next slide please. During the onset of um, the next slide please, uh, that uh, as because her mother is a, a health worker, so whole family faced stigma and the neighbors and everyone, everyone started to uh, avoid them. And unfortunately, her mother also contracted the COVID-19 and she had to be hospitalized for a month. And at that time, uh, Maliha lost all her support system. And that's when her uh, situation uh, just turned upside down. She lost every support and, uh, uh, and the continuous medicinal support as because she's also suffering from uh, Wilson's disease, uh, which requires intensive uh, care. Uh, and as because that care was not uh, provided for a month, so her condition really deteriorated. So she developed some uh, mental health problem also, like she's very anxious because she, is, she was not used to losing her mom's uh, support. And then she also developed some problem behavior and still it is going on. She's, she has become a bit distracted and very short tempered. And uh, as I said, that her education is also being uh, disrupted for the last 15 months. What we did uh, when we uh, were able to resume our support, we are uh, continuing with our previous supported, uh, supports. And uh, uh, through our um, national uh, resource center on deaf blindness, we are providing uh, all kinds of support she requests. And also we are uh, following up. Uh, some Most follow-ups follow are done through telephone and some are done uh, physical basis. So we will hear from her. Uh, but first she will, uh, as because her speech is very unclear, she will just introduce, uh, introduce herself and then her mom and then we'll be talking with her mom. Okay, Maliha, uh, uh, to unmute Karen. Maliha ke bole nun naam kori chaita dite tar kore bolte je or ma je or shko pakko hai kata bolte. Maliha. Bolo, bolo. Bolo. Namaste. 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 Namaste.
তোমার নাম কি তোমার নাম কি মালিহা ওকে তোমার নাম তোমার বয়স কত তোমার পক্ষ হয়ে তোমার মা আজকে আমাদের সাথে কথা বলবে তাই না আচ্ছা তাহলে মাকে বলো আমাদের সাথে কথা বলতে পড়েছিলেন বলেন আপা আমি আক্রান্ত হয় তার চিকিৎসা নিশ্চিত করতে ব্যয়বহুল হয়ে যায় আমি স্বাস্থ্যকর্মী হয় আমার আশেপাশের লোকজন সবাই এড়িয়ে চলত আমার মেয়েকে আমরা একটু আমি আপা আপনি যে কথাগুলো বলছেন আমি এটা একটু ইংরেজিতে ট্রান্সলেট করে দিই হ্যাঁ আচ্ছা <laughs> Maliha uh, even uh, went hungry for a uh, couple of days because no one was the, even there to uh, provide her food. So, uh, and uh, even the home-based home rehabilitation services which uh, Maliha used to receive from uh, CBD, that was also uh, disrupted. And Maliha is also very uh, attached with the, that rehab worker. So when uh, the visit was stopped she was very uh, mentally disturbed the why they are not coming and why everybody is leaving her and also uh, because uh, uh, as she was not being able to uh, when the mother when she got um, covid 19 she was affected with covid 19 she uh, got admitted in the hospital uh, so there was no one to take care of her at the home so uh, she uh, suffered a lot at that time but then when uh, cdd learned about uh, the condition then we started to uh, provide her emergency support and uh, which was uh, which saved maliha's life as per as she said can mute karen apa je support ta amra shobai mile apnar amra shobai mile apnader jonno kerechi e korte এই সাপোর্টটা কি আপনার জন্য যথেষ্ট এবং উপযোগী সাপোর্ট ছিল আপনার প্রেফারেন্স কোনটা ছিল যে ক্যাশ সাপোর্ট দেওয়াটা নাকি আপনাদেরকে জিনিসপত্র কিনে দিলে আপনাদের জন্য ভালো হবে ক্যাশ সাপোর্ট আপনাদের জন্য ভালো আছে কেন এটা
থ্যাংক ইউ আপা আমাদের সাথে কথা বলার জন্য থ্যাংক ইউ মালিয়া আমাদের সাথে কথা বলার জন্য আমি এখন ইংরেজিতে ট্রান্সলেট করে দিব তোমার আম্মু যেটা বলেছে ঠিক আছে রেখা একটু মিউট করে the kind the way the supports were provided it was uh, very uh, realistic and she appreciates the cat support because then she could decide uh, uh, which one needed priority and uh, they could spend money in that way and uh, as per their need and uh, she said that uh, the future supports uh, she would prefer to have cash support because then they can decide uh, as per their need and uh, also she mentioned that uh, without that support at that time they would not been able to survive uh, this long uh, pandemic situation uh, so if i have time then can i uh, go back to my slides please well anika i i think apologies mm -hmm. but i think we need to mm -hmm. um come to it to a close to give the other speakers mm -hmm. also a chance to okay. share their experience but mm -hmm. but thank you very much for for your powerful presentation to share the work thank that you. you have done with um with many persons with deaf blindness and their families and mm -hmm. a big thank you especially to you. malika and her mother for the courage to share their experience um i think it's a very powerful statement that kind of makes a lot of people think about what needs to be done to reach people who are otherwise really forgotten thank you so much anika and thank yeah, you so much like Malia. Um, I want to pass the word now to, to Esther Mukamori from the United Disabled Persons of Kenya, um, who was in UDPK, was engaged with Light for the World in a COVID-19 response work targeting um, small and medium or micro enterprises um, led by, by persons with disabilities. And we heard earlier from Lorraine about how you managed to build partnership with local OPDs to reach people and to, to provide services that are really kind of meaningful. Can you, can you share about the work and how you did it and what you have learned? Thank you very much, Johannes. Um, to begin with, what worked really well for us and Light for the World, enabling us to reach to quite a good number of local organizations of persons with disabilities, is that we already had existing networks in form of OPD members and the OPD leaders who essentially served as resource persons, helping us to reach others within the communities. And as well, um, the other thing we did was to synergize the COVID response project with other existing programs. So for instance, we linked with the Women with Disabilities project that we were running at the time and were able to identify a number of women-led OPTs to be beneficiaries in the project. As well, um, around the COVID period, we set up an SM, we'd set up an SMS platform. So as a way of um, passing along key messages on COVID to our members. So what we did is um, utilize the database of OPTs and individual members that we've worked with over the years. So sending out frequent key messages to their phones. And through this, we were able to reach over 2,000 people in all the counties of Kenya, be able to get their feedback on their experiences. And this really helped in um, the COVID response project. And um, apart from the SMS platform, we also held regular meetings via Zoom with the OPDs. And these were essentially around discussing COVID issues. And out of all of these mechanisms, we were able to identify um, beneficiaries for the COVID response project. So um, the effect of this on, on the program was that um, together with Light for the World, we were able to assist a number of these OPDs to keep their businesses afloat during the COVID period. So this is through the seed money grants that we issued and as well business development services support. Um, we also supported a number of OPDs to diversify and improve their livelihoods through trainings on making hand sanitizers, hand wash, and bleach, which were in high demand um, at the time. And through this, they became entrepreneurs making these products for sale. Um, another success as well is that we're able to link the, op the OPDs to opportunities available at the local level. Um, during this period, the counties in Kenya formed COVID response committees. 
which essentially served to spearhead the management of the pandemic at local level. And this included um, coordinating different types of social assistance. So we were able to link our, our OPDs to these opportunities. And as well, um, the forums that we created, they served as platforms to discuss issues even beyond um, economic stability. So for instance, we had security concerns uh, spe and specifically for persons with intellectual, hearing, mental health and other disabilities. And this is because um, the lockdowns in Kenya were being enforced by police. And because of the excessive force being used, we had, uh, we had death and actual injury to two persons, one with hearing impairment and one with intellectual um, impairment. And having these forums, they served as advocacy platforms to be able to highlight these issues and raise them with, um, with, with the relevant parties. Um, also, the involvement of women-led OPDs created a platform for discussion on an issue like gender-based violence. Gender-based violence was really rampant during this period, and we were able to link um, affected persons to, sub to organizations that could support them. And then um, um, now at the post-COVID period, now um, where counties are looking at are having post-COVID resilience discussions, the interventions that we had have equipped the local OPDs with that, with those, with that information and the skills that right now we are seeing increased interaction in those um, post-COVID resilience discussions at local level. Um, the other thing that I'd like to highlight on, on the role that the local OPDs played in ensuring that underrepresented groups were reached. And to begin with, as a national level OPD, UDPK is quite deliberate on reaching underrepresented groups in all our interventions. And we do this by leveraging on the expertise of expert organizations within our network. So for instance, we have organizations like the Kenya Association for the Intellectually Handicapped, which is one of our members, users and survivors of psychiatry in Kenya also are part of our network. So during the COVID period, we were able to um, utilize the knowledge and expertise from these organizations. Um, for instance, Kenya Association for the Intellectually Handicapped developed a number of easy to read materials, IC materials and messages, and were able to disseminate these to local OPDs so that um, they can, so that they could reach persons with intellectual disabilities and their support persons. And this included key messages on how to engage in uh, different discussions going on around COVID response. Um, looking at local OPDs, they bring in the diversity in representation of persons with disabilities within their membership. So underrepresented groups are within that membership. So us sharing this information with them um, the most, the, the key message or the key, um, the, 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 the key thing about this was that we wanted to ensure that local OPDs are able to support and advocate for the inclusion of self-advocates and support persons in the COVID response initiatives at, at um, county level. And the impact of this, or one of the results that we saw in this is that um, in the social assistance that was being provided by both government and non-governmental organizations. So for instance, the cash transfer program that was issued by the Kenyan government, the local OPDs were consulted to recommend persons with disabilities in vulnerable situations into the program. And most of the people that were recommended were persons with multiple impairments. And this was because um, we were able to support the local OPDs to be able to bring these messages uh, across to the, you know, the duty bearers. So um, these are just some of those examples of the role that um, OPDs and local OPDs have played in ensuring that underrepresented groups have been reached. And so, so it's just to reiterate that it's important for, it's important to, it's important to always include those mechanisms to support local OPDs to do self-advocacy and even advocacy for underrepresented groups. Back to you, Johannes. Yeah, thank you so much, Esther, for, for sharing how you set up the work in Kenya and, and demonstrating the, the importance of 
including OPDs at all levels, especially also at, at local level to reach um, underrepresented groups. This is also the experience we have had made in, in Bangladesh. Um, we already have had a couple of strong women speaking, but there is two, uh, two more strong women coming in the first um, part of this um, side event. Um, and the first one is Agnes Chindimba from Deaf Women Included in, in Zimbabwe. And I know you're not only a disability rights activist, but also a feminist. So I'm really keen to hear about what was the impact um, on, of COVID-19 on, on, on women with disabilities, on their OPDs and their role in the disability movement. And maybe you can share something about gender-based violence and what, that, what is your experience there? Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So when in Zimbabwe, when we had the first COVID case in March 2020, we had the national lockdown and we had a lot of challenges because of this lockdown, because we see that women and girls with disabilities, a lot of them, they actually work in informal trading, selling in town, selling or vending on the streets. So now when we had the lockdown, it means that they lost their livelihood. It means that there was a lot of hunger and also some of their needs like buying sanitary pads, it was actually a barrier for them. And also if you talk about violence, gender-based violence, we saw that there was an increase of the cases. For example, like in four months, Zimbabwe had maybe 5,000 girls who are of school going age who were actually married off. And this also includes girls with disabilities because we see that people usually abuse girls with disabilities because sometimes they don't know that there are those barriers when they try to report to the police. Because now, for example, somebody who is deaf, they are now at home and then how do they report to the police? They cannot even use the telephone. So it means that there was actually a lot of um, challenges with the government moving also resources to focus on the response, on the COVID-19 response, but they're also forgetting on other health needs, for example, family planning, contraception, sanitary pets, and which actually had some challenges at home. And also there were increasing cases of domestic violence. I'll give an example of a deaf woman who was saying that my husband every time was demanding sex and I would say, well, I don't have contraception. And that started domestic violence within the home as the husband continued to demand the sex. So we actually had a campaign for the paid drive to try and also support girls and women with disabilities with sanitary pads, with soaps that we also gave to them. And we also produced a lot of IEC materials in accessible formats because a lot of persons with disabilities were missing out on what COVID-19 is. There was actually an information gap because you get information on the radio or on the television, but there won't be any interpretation. So it means that deaf people are also missing out on this information. So really we started actually disseminating a lot of uh, IEC materials or social media groups because we wanted people with disabilities and deaf people to understand information in sign language. We also had uh, subtitles and we had voiceovers because we've got other friends who are visually impaired who also want to benefit. So we also joined the government's uh, communication group on health and COVID-19 and there are actually different partners, NGOs, UN agencies, all actually working together on the response mechanisms for the COVID-19 pandemic. So yes, we have joined the group and we're still actually making sure that the response mechanisms have got a disability voice. And also because it's important that policymakers understand inclusion. And also we were lucky because we saw that it was a very difficult time, with, especially with our budgets, Everybody was working from home. And so for example, at our office, we are five, six members. So if everybody's working at home, it means that you're now buying data for all these households. And it was difficult for us to, to actually change our budgets. And you know, sometimes online is also expensive because you also need to buy data. But we were lucky because we were working with Amplify Change and they also had, they were flexible with the budgeting. They allowed us to change the budgets to make it actually appropriate and responsive to the COVID-19 pandemic. Because when we did the budget, it was before the COVID-19 pandemic. And also Womankind, who actually, uh, they gave us um, a resilient fund because they understood that there actually needs that need to continue beyond the pandemic. 
because we also had our communities who were also suffering and some of them they were actually in very poor and devastating situations so we would also be able to support them so we would go even to the most marginalized communities and try to support the persons with disabilities in those areas so we tried to talk to our donor funders to also support us in different ways. And yes, they were responsive, especially those in the women's rights uh, movement, for example, Amplify Change and Womankind, and also uh, in other organizations that actually work on disability and SRHR. It is actually good to learn from such practices. And also we learned something which is important, that organizations of persons with disabilities, they're important because they actually help to solve some of the gaps that we have. Because sometimes the mainstream organizations, though, or maybe other, the mainstream would say, service providers would say, well, we don't know where people's disabilities are. So we've been actually partnering with other women's rights movements and other youth movements to conduct research and also other services. And also, well, another thing which is important is that persons with disabilities, they also need to lead in these resource mechanisms because they know what is important to them. They know their concerns, they know what, is, what they need. So I'll make my presentation short. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Agnes. Um, great, great info and, and great learning. And I, I think one of the points I'm, I'm picking up also is the importance of partnerships where you just said how important it was to partner with the women's rights movement, with the youth movement, but also with the government on communication and so on. And it all helps to, to increase access, et cetera. So I think a lot of, um, of very useful learning in, in your intervention. Um, finally, now we are hearing from you, from Deborah Yute from the National Union of Disabled People of Uganda. Um, and she will share experiences from Uganda on what are the learned what were the lessons learned in Uganda on making the voices of persons with disabilities heard in the COVID-19 response? And maybe also giving us hints on what more needs to be done um, in the COVID-19 recovery and policy making more generally. Um, Deborah, please go ahead. Deborah, can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity giving Uganda that's in Odipu to share its experience on COVID-19. Next slide. First of all, we want to share the experience on the area of COVID, whereby we got more of the challenge barriers and whereby we created the structures like for example, put some the uh, online of getting masks, teaching them how to make the sanitizers, how to sanitize their equipment, and also that was creating awareness on them. And we also wanted to get all that information to persons with disabilities. Then another challenge was information. Communication was a barrier, access to information. Many people, maybe blind, could not read the information. And also people who are deaf from grassroots got challenges to access this information. So it was a, big, a very big barrier to all the community. And economically, also people got a, a challenge whereby most persons with disability lost their jobs. At the end of it, the expenditure and the livelihood went down. And people started suffering from poverty, taking them back to where they were left. And the area of employment, the, the staff were a bit affected in different organizations, and mostly affected were persons with disabilities. It is, that was a big challenge for persons with disabilities. And whereby it needed maybe people who have been given opportunities to work at home. But imagine a person with a disability could not have equipment that would enable him or her to work at home. So on the side of health, 
it was really a big challenge. Like for example, we are talking of that we must prevent, we must put on masks. The, the, the Minister of Health could send out information, eh? but there were no interpreters. Then uh, another issue was about home learning. The time COVID started, it, they closed most of the schools and they, the learners who had to learn from home. But remember, we have deaf blind people. We have the deaf, we have the blind. These groups were too much affected eh? that they could not continue their education at home. So that was lack of information access to them. Then in the area of gender-based violence, families had to, because of the income, low income on families, issues of gender-based violence increased very much, which gave people stress to the extent that some, some of the things also cost them, costed them to go more and more acquiring disabilities and many families break, break down. And then in the area of security, it affected majorly persons with the hearing impairment. Mm. Like now they say that deaf people don't know what they say, curfew time. So they could move any time and at the end of it, they were beaten. And, uh, and one, of, one of deaf people was shut down, shut down and uh, now he has become fiscally again disabled just because of access to information which he didn't get. So there was also another issue about the food distribution. In some areas it was good, but in some areas persons with disability majorly missed this food from government. The next slide. We have seen, yes, there are so many challenges, but we as NUDIPU, as an umbrella organization for persons with disabilities, we want to say thank you very much for partners, for giving us funds in the area of COVID awareness. The media campaigns, the TVs, the press conferences. So NUDIPU had to create more awareness in the area of COVID to persons with disabilities. So most of these people, when they saw maybe on TV, really came to understand that eh, this, these things, uh, this COVID is really very serious. Whereby we had to put sign language interpreters on the TVs. Even when the president was giving speeches, we could have uh, deaf people whereby deaf, uh, sign language interpreters whereby the deaf people got information. So our advocacy helped to sensitize and also improve on the food distribution. Yes, there was a need, but to some extent, we saw that persons with disabilities also got from the provisions of food distribution. So also our advocacy helped government to government to appreciate the representation of persons with disabilities on the National Task Force on COVID. So this person sits and engages and communicates and shares on issues of disability. And this was also replicated up to district level that each district, each task force in the district has to have the representative of persons with disability and also to create awareness on the needs of persons with a disability and that COVID. We also submitted a, a, a paper on the issue of that's on the issue of task force, like issues of, of education for economic transition, security. All we had to be put in this paper at different levels. Eh? So we hope that in this recovery report, eh, it will also help to uplift the lives of persons with a disability after this. Next slide. 
So what else do we want need to do at the moment? No, it's not only Ugandan government, but it's all the worldwide. We want to we want to request a financial compensation for persons with disabilities who have lost their jobs so that maybe they can start businesses to improve their lives. But we are advocating this and requesting this not only for Uganda, but let it be worldwide. Let, let the governments give financial support to persons with disabilities and also tax exemption for persons with disabilities to help them to get equipment that will enable them to work at home. Like right now we are <laughs> like now like now teleworking at home then also to strengthen employment laws prioritizing on the employing persons with disability especially in the times like this emergency that the persons with disability would also be retained at places of work we also need to speed the regulations on persons with disabilities to, to, to help in case if it's really approved immediately, it will help to implement the Persons with Disability Act. Next slide. We also want to promote the involvement of organizations of persons with disabilities. In case of anything that they would be consulted, like in the area of COVID, they would be consulted what should be done, what involvement and what idea should be given. It's also very important to have data of persons with disabilities who have been affected by COVID to help them in the planning and budgeting. If government has data, of persons with disabilities that have been affected by persons with disabilities, it will be easy for the government to budget for them. So we, there is also a need to have a comprehensive social, comprehensive social protection framework in line with the needs of persons with disabilities, especially those who have double disabilities. And so that caretakers, parents, like for example, deaf blind, the parents should be given at least some money to help them keep these people and give them their livelihood. Next slide. Then also on the area of the education actors, we need to see the, the continuity of education. Like now in Uganda, we are in the second round of lockdown. Ed education sector should think of different innovative, different approaches on how to persons with disability can also learn at home, accessible information, accessible in home learning. Lastly, then in the second and the third wave of COVID, we have seen that there are so many causes. So, cases. So we request that government should also protect persons with disability, especially in the medical center. All centers should have interpreters and have accessible information. And also in the area of vaccination programs, they should also see how persons with disabilities are also protected. Governments all worldwide, please, we request that you give in the programs of vaccination that interpreters would be there to give services for persons with disabilities. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Deborah for sharing um, learning and experience from Uganda and especially for pointing to some of the areas what more needs to be done. And you mentioned um, a couple of times economic recovery, which is the focus of our second part in this side event. And so I'm handing over to my colleague Simon Brown to lead us through the second part. Simon, please. Thanks, Johannes. And um, thank you, everyone. Um, just a quick reminder, if you do have any questions for any of the um, presenters and speakers, do pop them into the Q&A tab um, we'll likely um, 
carry on after the scheduled end time to have a that question and answer session for anybody who wants to stay on. Um, um, but let me introduce this this um, part of the session um, and, and first introduce our two uh, speakers, Stephen and Jenga, who is the country director of Light for the World in Kenya, and Jake Appel, who is the chief executive officer of the Alvino Foundation in Nigeria. In Nigeria. Um, and as, as Johanna said, this, this session, this part of the session is focused on livelihood response and economic recovery. And we're going to turn to Stephen first. Stephen, Kenya's economy fared reasonably well in 2020, better than expected, um, with an overall contraction of just over 1%. Um, agriculture continued to grow, manufacturing and the services sector had a tough time. But what did the period look like for micro enterprises, particularly? Micro enterprises of persons with disability. What impact did it have on them, and what support mechanisms were available to them? Stephen. Thank you, Simon. Hello, everyone. Uh, good question. And, and first, I think the, uh, there is a bit of debate about the level of con contraction of the Kenyan economy uh, based on the types of uh, data sets that are uh, used to arrive at, at, at these kind of figures. But let me put it into perspective what really the situation is, is in Kenya, um, economically speaking. So the government has uh, continued to invest over time in pro poor uh, projects, uh, focusing mostly on education and social protection, um, universal health care, which are welcome, uh, but not, not performing quite well. And yet there's a powerful tool to cushion the effect of COVID-19 on persons with disabilities. This has been going on well, looking back from 2015 all the way to 2019, with an average expenditure of 21.5% and 6.7% on education and social protection of the government revenue. Um, but, but going forward from 2020, um, there is a massive uh, debt servicing, which is uh, up to 43% uh, in 2020, and is expected to continue growing in 2021. Um, which is putting this into perspective is more than health and social protection and housing combined. Uh, this trend is expected to continue. Um, and, and what this means is that the uh, allocation uh, that the government would uh, spend on uh, initiatives that are supporting economic recovery uh, in focus on persons with disabilities is uh, diminished. So this uh, uh, leaves the government with very little leeway for investment in this kind of investments. Uh, and looking at the, pre, the, the current budget of 2020-2021, only 9.2 million euro has been allocated to, to cash transfer programs and social protection for persons with disabilities. What this means is that looking at the total population of Kenyans with disabilities, this uh, serves about 4.7%. And this is only on cash transfers. And you know, this is targeted just to uh, people with severe uh, disabilities or caregivers of children with uh, severe disabilities. So what this means is that the majority of persons with disabilities in Kenya are not supported in any way by the government uh, in terms of either involving themselves in economic uh, empowerment activities and neither are policies set aside to uh, support inclusion in procurement opportunities or, or uh, job opportunities or even education. So, so I think this is, um, this is really the situation in Kenya. And, and looking back, uh, what we did um, in, in 2019 is uh, involving um, uh, uh, micro entrepreneurs in, um, let's say, support, uh, for provision of food and assistive devices, because most of them lost uh, businesses. As uh, my colleague from Uganda has mentioned, schools are closed. It means children are at home, you can't do business. And so what the program has supported is uh, providing startup uh, kits, which involves capacity building around pivoting for a uh, next business venture, and also providing food and assistive devices to allow these entrepreneurs to get back on, on uh, an economic recovery journey. So there is need for new types of assistive devices. And as you are aware that since everything is now digital, 
it means that uh, there is a lot more need on capacity building on how to do business online, how to participate, how to market products online, how to reduce costs um, doing business by leveraging on new technologies. So Brilliant. this is, yeah. Thank Brilliant. You. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Jake, and Stephen, I'll come back to you in a moment. Jake, the, um, the Inclusion Works uh, labour market assessments from 2019 are just being refreshed as the longer term economic impacts of COVID become more visible. Um, what is the assessment beginning to tell us about the impacts on the economy and employment in Nigeria throughout 2020 and into 2021? Can you give us a quick, a very brief summary of what that looks like? Okay, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Um, let me run you through some figures uh, of what is happening in terms of uh, the economy in the country and uh, uh, the part that um, the economy is playing in the life of persons with disability. First, to say that uh, part of the problem, even with the slowness in the economy, is the fact that um, an intervention, economic intervention was put in place without the people that uh, they are intervening for. Uh, in other words, uh, persons with disability were not, were not carried along in some of the intervention efforts. Effort. So um, you can see that uh, many persons with disability are not even aware of the intervention. But the first quarter of 2020, uh, we had 1.87 growth in GDP, uh, the second quarter 6.1% uh, cost by fall in oil uh, contributed to GDP by 6.63% uh, as well as negative growth in Nigerian economy. Uh, fall in the price of oil and the slowness of the economic activities uh, following the lockdown. The third quarter, sorry, my, my screen is a bit faster. The third quarter, uh, we had 3.6% uh, caused by, again, uh, negative uh, caused by the uh, oil glut and 13.89% uh, in the third quarter. Uh, here in Nigeria, we experienced uh, a second recession uh, in the second time in the four years. The fourth quarter is interesting. Uh, we had a bit of a jump, uh, which was not expected. I call it a miracle. 0.11% uh, uh, growth. Uh, there was slight uh, surprising growth in the uh, fourth quarter uh, in 2020 due to the resumption of economic activities following the easing of uh, restricted movement. Uh, a number of uh, uh, intervention that they put in place also uh, contributed to this. This positive but slow growth had not been uh, equal or linear across different sectors as the service sector responsible for the employment of a large uh, proportion of Nigerian is lagging behind in her recovery compared to the agricultural and manufacturing sector, which has grown by 2% and 3% respectively. Now in 2021, uh, I'm sorry, I have a lot of figure in my presentation. Uh, in 2021, interestingly, we have another, we had another growth, uh, basically, from contribution to the oil sector. There's been a jump in the price, which is uh, of immense uh, uh, contribution to the growth in the economy. Now, um, the unemployment and underemployment um, is of interest. Uh, it, it became more evident that the prevalence of uh, COVID. Uh, 19, which affects, uh, became more prominent in 2021. Nigeria recorded on unemployment rate of 27% in the second quarter of 2020, uh, which uh, coinc coincided with a period of lockdown in Nigeria, and this grew to 33.21% in the fourth quarter of 2020. Now, based on the labor market assessment, uh, again, like I said, I have a lot of figures. Based on the labor market assessment, unemployment rates are particularly evident in the higher education population, less lower level of education, possibly reflected or reflective uh, of the relative struggle in the service sector, uh, reducing the opportunity to economically 
uh, migrate. Youths are uh, disproportionately impacted, uh, female relatively more than male and urban more than rural. Now, with a large population in Nigeria being employed in the uh, informal sector, particularly the service sector, uh, forgive me if I have uh, some spelling error, uh, blame it on my eyes, uh, it lagged behind in the growth and the restricted movement due to COVID-19, in addition to poor working conditions, brought about economic losses reduced demand, lack of access to market, as well as loss of mobility of people and goods. In spite of the economic stimulus package, uh, which the government put together, uh, unfortunately, as you know, that many uh, of uh, persons with disability had no access to most of this economic uh, uh, stimulus package, uh, simply because they have no businesses. Um, and then, of course, many of them are not even aware of what the uh, packages were. So it was put in place by government as part of its uh, COVID-19 economic uh, sustainability plan. The effect has not been able to trickle down effectively to persons in the uh, informal sector. This is due to unregistered business, uh, of course, from the community. Most of them are not aware of the registration process. Many of them don't have accounts. Um, so it's very difficult to actually, for them to access uh, all of this uh, stimulus uh, package. Um, Thanks, Jake. I'm gonna have to, sorry, I'm gonna have to interrupt you there. Thank you for that. I'm gonna come back to you very briefly in a moment, but just switching back to, to, to Stephen. Um, Stephen, looking at the economic recovery, and, and the additional, what additional mechanisms are going to be really important important for those micro enterprises, um, either through stimulus packages or restructuring mechanisms like AGPO? Um, maybe give the one or two really tremendously important um, mechanisms that are going to be uh, supportive of, of micro enterprises of persons with disabilities. Um, yeah, thank you. I think one of the most important things that can happen either through government or through uh, intervention of uh, non-governmental organizations um, in supporting OPDs in reaching uh, persons with disabilities is um, reducing costs uh, that come, uh, that are associated with um, the various types of uh, impairments um, that have been uh, in the previous studies been quite a big uh, cost uh, for uh, the specific cases of the entrepreneurs that we work with, uh, we have realized that when uh, we are considering or when we are collecting their data and checking uh, what are your costs, what are your profits, we have realized that quite a lot of money goes into uh, doing business or the, the administrative costs. So it means cost of the distribution, cost of delivery. Um, so costs which are not there for any other entrepreneur in Kenya without a disability. So, and we have realized that even when interventions are provided uh, and, and there is provision of opportunities to get into procurement or employment, um, the, 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 the total net that is left with this entrepreneur is still this small in comparison to um, entrepreneurs without disabilities. And there needs to be um, interventions in, in this. Um, number one, in terms of uh, capacity building, so that uh, people with disabilities who are doing business are aware how they can reduce their cost of uh, doing business and how they can leverage on the provided um, uh, social structures within government to reduce this. And number two is building um, much more engagement with the private sector, um, because in the economic recovery uh, strategy, which has been uh, still be, it's still in draft, and there is a lot of discussion between the government and the private sector, um, the government will keep injecting into uh, money in different projects, and the organizations that are uh, uh, allocated uh, roles in this kind of uh, projects are uh, within the private sector. So it makes a lot of sense then. Uh, to bring along the private sector in the economic recovery journey of, uh, with a focus on persons with disabilities. This means that they get to get subcontracts, they get to get procurement and uh, provision of services to these uh, projects which are funded by government. Because from the look of it and in the current strategies, there is not a specific 
uh, intervention program designed by government that is focusing on economic recovery and persons with disabilities. Okay, so thank those you. are the two main points I would mention, Simon. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And and Jake, very very briefly, what are we going to have to do differently or more of? to make sure that the recovery plans are fully inclusive in terms of employment? Okay, again, I'll go back to my slide and uh, uh, get to the summary because you wanted me to um, summarize what can be done. Um, well, um, um, it's, it's important to bring everybody to the table. Uh, it's important um, to look at um, issues that can uh, serve as a, an opening uh, for, for the labor market. The engagement of the private sector is of, uh, trade will, will, will yield a lot of uh, uh, interest in getting persons with uh, disability uh, employed in the labor market. We have just, uh, uh, through the, the work we're doing with size savers, engaged the largest uh, private sector um, organization, which is the Chamber of Commerce in the city of Abuja. And all, all, all the members uh, were surprised at the level of qualified individuals that we have uh, in the community who are looking for job. And of course, you know that many times the impression is that we're not qualified. The impression is that we don't have what it takes to function in the labor market. And um, that opportunity gave us uh, that singular opportunity gave us the opportunity to um, let the private sector, which is the largest employer of labor, know what we have. But let's talk about the barriers as I round up. Of course, societal attitude, the attitude of people, and even the attitude of persons with disability themselves, that sometimes when they have the opportunity to confront those that will give job, they personalize their, their interest and put their interest ahead and above uh, the community. That also is a barrier. Perception of low um, um, capacities, uh, infrastructure and uh, building accessibility and reluctance from employers to provide technological accommodation to perform effectively within the workspace. Uh, some vulnerable groups, particularly to persons with disability in the workplace, are abused sexually, verbally, uh, physically. And, and so on and so forth. But I want to end by saying that uh, um, the persons with disability, until government begins to uh, probably uh, create incentives, you know, for employers of labor, like tax rebates, you know, like um, given certain, you know, fruitful incentive to employers of labor so that they can engage and employ persons with disability. There's also a need for proper awareness uh, within the community of persons with disability for those of, those of them who are qualified to come out, come out of their shell and place themselves in the labor market. We're engaging the Ministry of Labor in Nigeria and letting, letting them know what information that they have to pass on to those that are within their system. I, I want to close by saying that all of us on this platform and everyone that is listening to us, the day you were born, you cried. Everyone around you rejoiced. We must live our lives so well that the day we die, we will rejoice and everyone around us will cry. That's a life of contribution. We must contribute to the society that we find, found ourselves. Thank you. Beautiful, thanks, Jake. And thanks, Stephen, also for both of you for being really insightful on that on the on that livelihood um, impact and and looking forward also in terms of inclusive recovery. I'm going to hand back now to to um, to Lorraine um, to, to to make some closing remarks. Um, Lorraine, back to you. Yep. Thanks very much. Um, well, um, yes, closing remarks, well, I had no time at all um, in which to summarise what has been a fascinating and, and fantastic panel. Um, I'm, it, it's very difficult to summarise, except I think one of the things that has struck me is that there is very, very clear evidence that there were huge gaps. And the thing about this pandemic is that it exposed a lot of those gaps. 
in the past, I think those gaps would have just continued and been fairly, you know, not many people were taking much notice. What has struck me about all of the things I've heard today is the amount of involvement that OBDs and individuals with disabilities have been having in advocating to mitigate against those gaps. And I've seen lots and lots of innovative and interesting stuff happening. I wish the gaps hadn't been there, but I feel empowered in some way by the fact that so many people have been working so hard on behalf of some very, very under-resourced um, people um, to make that difference. So uh, I feel that there is a level of empowerment um, which I haven't really experienced before. So I would like to say thank you very, very much to absolutely everyone who contributed to this. Um, and I hope that um, everyone had um, an informative session. Thank you.